school's about. So this is again like Beth's talk, providing an overview for basically the rest of the week. So, Alida, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is this working? One, two, three, four. I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Good. So. Uh, as, as Ingrid said in her introductory talk this morning, if I start to go, I'm talking really fast now and you can't understand the word I'm saying, then slow me down because Scottish people tend to speak very quickly, so I will try to remember to, to slow it and modulate it. So just stick your hand up if I'm going too quickly. The purpose of this talk is really just to give, to set everyone on the same page in terms of what we mean by indicators, what they're used for, um, what they can do, what they can't do, and the kind of things we have to be careful of. So for some of you who have already done a lot of work with indicators, that might seem a little bit basic. Um, but what we wanted to do is make sure that we're all on the same page, and if we have any questions at this fundamental stage, we can sort them out at, uh, at right at the beginning of the workshop. The first point I want to make is that indicators are not trivial. Um, when I first started working with these sort of back in the 90s, it was sort of like the, the great nirvana. Indicators would solve all our problems. We wouldn't have to do complicated modeling anymore. And just a simple indicator will give us a simple communicated message. But you couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, we have to be very careful about the indicators we use. We have to understand their behavior. And we have to select them very carefully. And those are some of the things we'll talk about over the next few days. So this is just a quote from a, a, a an earlier paper, which says that environmental indicators have to come to play a vital Reporting. They have taken on such importance because they provide a sign or a signal that relays a complex message, potentially from numerous sources in a simplified manner. So that kind of explains what indicators do. So this is what I'm going to cover in this presentation. So we'll talk about what indicators are, why we need them, some specific functions of indicators, um, different types, simple versus complex, some frameworks which use indicators, um, talk briefly about why we need suites of indicators, and I'm just going to talk about reference points if we get that far, but we're not going to delve into them until a later point, and Scott's going to delve into them much further, I think, thresholds, etc. All right, so what are indicators? There's several definitions out there. Uh, I like to use the sort of classic FAO definition, which is basically a sort of a variable, a pointer, an index. It's something that communicates information, and its changes over time can tell you something about the, the, the system or the issues that you're studying. Um, its position in relation to, again, we use the word reference points, indicates uh, where you are in relation to where you might want to be or to where you might not want to be. So, And it can also provide a bridge between objectives. So if your objective is to um, have a healthy ocean and your indicator is, let's say, uh, some sort of measure of eutrophication, then it lets you to, to bridge that gap between your objective and then what you do to get to your objective. I think equally useful is to think of indicators as indirect measures. Um, often they're, th uh, they're a measure of something we can't measure directly. I'm not quite sure if that makes sense. Um, you know, we're used to measuring temperature, we're used to measuring salinity, uh, nitrogen level, etc. But there's some things that are less tangible. And so, for example, thinking of fish communities, uh, mean size in the community is more of an indirect measure of the structure of, of the size structure of that community. And of course, there are, there are many, many different types of indicators, um, both on, from the abiotic world, sea surface temperature, salinity, etc., biotic, economic indicators, social indicators, indicators of governance, um, including management. So there's a, a huge literature on indicators. I'm sure some of you are aware of this. And then each of the different kind of areas of interdisciplinary science that we now bring to sort of climate change science and resource management, they're, they're in each of those different areas, there are lots of different indicators and more are appearing every day. And some indicators are very specific uh, for, for a specific purpose. Others are used in many different contexts. And uh, getting an understanding of, of when they're used and why is, is quite important. Um, there's sort of two broad classes of indicators too, sort of are we, what we call are we there yet indicators. So 
we, we have a target, and this is a measure of performance against that target. So, for example, if the, uh, the target is, uh, it's all, I'll, I'll use many examples from the fisheries world because that's, that's largely my background. So, if your target is to have a biomass level of 50,000 or 100,000 tonnes, and your survey index is telling you you're 70,000 tonnes, then you've still got a ways to go before you get to your target. So, this is kind of like a performance indicator or measure. And then we have much more descriptive indicators, which you can also have reference points. Um, you can have state indicators, like this is the state of the system right now, trend indicators, spatially based indicators. Um, indicator is basically a catch-all term for something we measure or a proxy for another measurement. All right. So why do we need indicators? And I think Beth has already outlined some of those reasons in her initial presentation. Um, According to UNEP, indicators uh, provide four basic functions. So one is simplification. Um, the systems we deal with are essentially complex, non-linear systems. And we need to, to have a, a simplification of that system in order to communicate messages. And as we know, our ecosystems have multiple interactions within those systems, both intra- and interspecific interactions. We are also forced by climate, by anthropogenic drivers, and again, Beth outlined those many anthropogenic drivers that are out there, uh, physical drivers, and then, of course, there's the services that we draw, those services in inverted commas that we draw from these oceans. And so we need indicators that simplify the system in order for us to understand how they're changing, what the drivers are, the response, and the state. Uh, we also want to quantify how things have changed. And so by looking at indicators over time allows us to track those changes over time. And this figure just simply shows some uh, indicators of ecosystem status in a, in a few different systems from, a, from the indices project. Um, and so knowing what the direction of change conveys, so for example, if an indicator decreases and that's considered to be a negative signal, then following that trend over time obviously shows that you're uh, system is either changing in a good direction or a, a negative direction. I think one of the very important functions of an indicator is standardization. If you calculate an indicator in the same way across multiple areas, then you can compare directly. And this is some work by Stephen Halpern et al. It was published a few years ago, where they looked at the cumulative impact, human impact across the globe. Uh, using a, a complex series of measurements, but nonetheless, these measurements com uh, were uh, amalgamated in each area to provide us of one synoptic view of human impact. And you can see you know, very uh, simply on a map such as this where the high areas of impact are and where the low ones are. So it's a, it's a very good tool to visualize change and to be able to compare uh, across many different places. Oops. Didn't go anywhere. Am I stuck? Oh no. All right. And then, lastly, communication and education. Uh, indicators. It's important that indicators can convey clear messages, and that they're a communication tool that can bridge between science and decision makers, policy makers, etc. So it's important that they're understandable. And different indicators, as again we'll talk about later, some are more easily understandable than others. So the indicators you choose will depend on the context in which they're used. Um, and just to highlight the point that, that this, this is, um, you know, the, the aim of the summer school is to bridge the gap between research assessment, policy and management, and indicators have a very important role to play there. And this is why we're giving them this emphasis. Oh, and here we have another quote. Um, environmental indicators provide an important source of information for policymakers and help to guide decision making as well as monitoring and evaluation because you can provide valuable information about complex issues. So that's just to show you, it's not just me telling you this, this is in the literature, they're very well recognized as important tools. All right, so some specific functions of indicators. Any questions, anyone? I'm just sort of prattling on here. All right, so they can measure the overall state of ocean health in the management area. So again, this is a little bit fisheries focused, but all these concepts are, are widely applicable. So this is an example of, of um, the use of ind indicators to produce what we call an ecosystem status report. Um, 
this is from Canada, it's a little bit old now, but it's uh, one of the first kind of synoptic ecosystem assessments, if you like, that came out. And we looked at human, so physical indicators, human indicators, biological indicators, um, and came up with this kind of diagram, which basically this shows you how the system has changed across all these different indicators. Um, and so this is ranked based on a multivariate analysis, and we'll hear about some of these techniques over the next few days. And this simply shows that the indicators at the top of this figure are essentially indicators that show that mean body size, um, uh, size abundance, troll surface area, groundfish landings, length of age, these have all decreased in a negative direction from 1960 to 2000. Whereas in the, on the lower half are those indicators that have increased, and these are indicators of gray seal abundance, human population, uh, landed values, etc. So showing how the system has changed very broadly over time. So sort of two major changes, such as smaller fish, um, uh, increased gray seals. These are some of the, the messages that we get from this. Um, they also allow you to uh, measure the state of different ecosystem attributes at different spatial scales. So you can look at water, you know, water properties, biodiversity, resilience, etc. And just to show you some specific indicators, again, that we've used uh, on the Scotian Shelf, which is the area that I study in Canada. Uh, so it's an indication of species diversity. So we can see that you know, this is 1970 to 2012. So we see a lot of variability. Um, and then a plunge and another increase. We seem to be high, quite high diversity. But then if we look at this, which is a large fish indicator, which is used quite widely now as an indicator of ecosystem status, that has decreased and now stabilized. An indicator of community condition, which has decreased over time, which is a measure of ecosystem functioning. And a measure of resilience has also decreased. So you can, you can get a very, um, build up a, a picture, a mosaic of your systems by looking at e indicators of different ecosystem properties. Uh, again, you can measure impacts, effects, consequences, and another example from Canada is to look at the impact of overfishing in Newfoundland. Um, this is a, a well-discussed example of a collapse of a cod fishery, and here our indicator of the effect is fishing unemployment rate. So the cod collapsed here, there was initially a decrease in unemployment, but then you see this massive increase in unemployment rate as a result of the loss of the fishery. So this is a different type of indicator that we're uh, used to looking at, but it's one of the major socioeconomic implications of this change. And then lastly, uh, indicators can evaluate the effectiveness of governance around ocean and climate change. Um, and this is, again, an example from the fish world, but it's, again, something that can be applied more broadly. In this case, the uh, y-axis here is removal rate of fisheries, but it could also be sea surface temperature warming rate, and, and where are we in terms of stock status. So here we have a, a limit reference point, which is basically the reference point below which you don't want to go. And then here, an upper stock reference point. So this is a healthy zone. If you're here, you can fish at this rate. If you go below this limit, then um, you have to decrease the fishing, and if you go below, below this limit, then um, you, you cease fishing altogether. So these are what are called harvest control rules, so they're management measures. And then as an example from the real world, this is the scallop fishery, Canadian scallop fishery on George's Bank, and all these different dots show where they are on the various years over time. And here we are in 2010, nicely in the healthy zone, so I'm showing you this because it's a picture of, you know, Canadian good management, ha <laughs> ha. Um, but these kind of tools allow you then to, 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 to be able to, to, determine, to determine the effectiveness of your management measures. So back here, clearly we weren't managing the stock very well. Uh, but now management measures have changed. So this allows us to, to gauge the effectiveness of our management and the health of the stock at the same time. Um, there are other functions. Uh, looking at uh, inputs to trade-off analyses. Beth mentioned these this, this morning, to feed into rule-based decision-making, communication tools. And Keith is going to talk more about this side of things on, I think it's on Friday. Right, Keith? Thursday. Is it Thursday? Thursday oh, Thursday and Friday. OK. So just bookmark that for the, the end of the week. All right, again, just to underscore the wide variation in indicators, um, you can get very simple indicators and extremely complex indicators. 
you know, simple ones are sort of, you know, biomass of functional groups in the system, like the biomass of piscivores or benthivores, detritivores. These are simple indicators that tell you much about the structure of your fish community. From a, more in the physical t uh, world, is sea surface temperature, of course, is a simple indicator. Your amount of uh, dissolved carbon, salinity, nitrate, etc., number of fisheries jobs. So these are simple. They're clear to others what they mean, and they don't really require a lot of uh, interpretation. Um, then you get into racial indicators, which are appealing and are widely used, um, both in the, the, the biochemical world, but also in the, the ecological world, in the social world. So, you know, landed value to GDP is, is one that's classically used to, to measure the um, performance of fisheries. But then when you look at these uh, racial indicators, the problem with them is you don't know exactly what's changing whether it's uh, your, your numerator or your denominator. And to give you an example, this is the landed value to GDP ratio uh, over time from 61 to 2006. And so you can see that, you know, after a sort of brief increase here, we get a massive decline, which then continues. So is that decreasing because landed value decreased, or is it because D GDP decreased, or both? And the answer to that is going to change, you know, how you interpret that and what you might do about it. And so if you look at landed value, you see that it follows closely the LV to GDP ratio. So that seems to be determining it. And if you look at GDP, that's actually increased through the whole time period. And you wouldn't guess that simply by looking at the ratio. So you have to be careful with ratio indicators. That's the basic message here. And even when using ratios, you have to look at the components of that ratio to make sure you understand their behavior too. And then we get into much more complex indicators that are, you know, sort of lots of things feed into them. Uh, and there's a whole suite of those out there too. And I'm just going to talk, touch very briefly on the Ocean Health Index, which we're going to talk about more, I think, on Wednesday. But this is a very good example of a very complex indicator. Uh, there are 10 goals and sub-goals that feed into this indicator, everything from food provisioning, fishing, carbon storage, coastal protection, tourism, sense of place, clean waters. And for each of these different goals and sub-goals, they have indicators that feed into them. So different measures go into each of these sub-goals. And then they're all basically uh, just average to provide an overall index score. Uh, so there's 10 goals, each of them account for 10%. Uh, now, the trouble with these complex indicators is then that you can have the same score, but there's many different ways to get to the score. So this is one example, and this is what's called a petal diagram, and these are quite commonly used. So here's the overall skull. These are the, you know, the goals around the edge, and then the depth of the color is essentially the score of the indicator. I think it goes from zero to uh, 100. So this is carbon storage. So this system does very well in carbon storage but very poorly on tourism and recreation. And then for the same score, um, you can see this one does very well on tourism and recreation, still pretty good in carbon storage. And then again, another 61. And you can see how the petal pattern changes. So there are many ways to get to one score. So although it's a simple indicator in the sense, okay, this is a score of 61 versus 54, you actually have to look at the detail to understand what, why you get to that score. So it's not to say that complex indicators are not useful, but because of their complexity, they require greater um, consideration and understanding. All right. How are we doing time? That's good. So there are many frameworks out there that use indicators. Indicators are, are generally not used as a single entity. They're used in combination with um, frameworks and other tools. And I just want to briefly talk about a few frameworks that are, are commonly used. And the, and the classic one is the DIPSA framework, or the Driver Pressure State Impact Response Framework. And I'm guessing most of you are familiar with that. C can I have a show of hands? Who's familiar with DIPSA? All right, so we're not all. Okay, most of them are over there. Ask who is not. Okay. All right, who, who's not familiar with DIPSA? <laughs> All right, a lot of people are undecided. Okay. <laughs> um, but the DIPSA framework is essentially a, a way of thinking about your um, overall system 
and thinking, okay, what are the drivers? And, they, and, and they're sort of drivers at the large scale. So they can be, uh, well, here there's an example of industrial production, um, which is, you know, this can be at all different scales, uh, industrial production in fisheries, but it can be in industrial production in terms of, you know, steel-making factories and the pollution they cause. And then that has results in pressures such as carbon dioxide emissions. And then the, the pressures have an... Uh, um, you want to look at the state of the system in relation to those pressures, the impact of those pressures, and then the responses. And those can be responses um, both in terms of governance, management, at individual community level. So each of these blue blobs here can be considered in an interdisciplinary way. It's not just, um, you know, uh, the, the state in an ecological way. It could be the state in, in a social way also. So there are many different indicators for these different pressures, sorry, different um, aspects of the, the DIPSER framework. Uh, just to give you a, a quick example, this is some work uh, we did in a, a project a wee while back. Um, so if we think of our, again, thinking about the marine system, uh, so we have drivers such as uh, climate, fishing, as we saw earlier, um, drivers and pressures, and we have the state of the system, for example, we can think of trophic structure, size structure. Um, there are impacts, so the, the, the pressures have impacts on ecosystem integrity, there can be economic implications. And then there can be various responses at policy and legislation, legislation level, programs, um, ecosystem-based management, climate change adaption. And then, oops, sorry, wrong way. And then, we, the, 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 so to get back to the beginning of the loop, that feeds back then into drivers and pressures. And hopefully, the idea, of course, is what we do here, the responses will ameliorate these drivers and pressures and have consequences in the system. So it's not just one loop of the system. You would be continually monitoring indicators of each of these elements. And um, so what we did was we looked at indexes, for example, of the states. Uh, so measures of phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, different aspects of the, the fish groups, um, and, and looked at the time series of those uh, for those um, measures, and then also looked for indicators of climate change and or climate and fishing, so temperature industries, stratification, water mass indices, and aspects of fishing. And I'm not going to go into this analysis any further here, but we used all these different indicators and time series and put it into a multi-attribute frequency analysis in order to figure out what were the connections between these indicators, what were the main drivers, what were the main responses. So it allows you to get quite a, uh, allows you to explore your system and understand the connections between the different uh, pressures, the, the, the state and the response. Okay, this is a, um, another framework within which, which is being used increasingly, particularly in the US, the Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. Um, I was trying to find examples of this, and they've done quite, I mean, there's like five or six different regions in the US, Pacific region, the California current, Alaska, et cetera, and they're all implementing this Integrated Ecosystem Assessment approach, and they're all in different phases, and they're looking at it very, very interdisciplinary. So there's a report on the ecological integrity, and there's a report on the sort of the fishing side. But as far as I could determine, and Scott, I don't know if you've got a better idea, um, I couldn't yet find anything which put everything together. Do you know of anything? I think that's in the works, but I don't think that's I don't think they're there yet, yeah. Yeah, and the reason for that, and that's certainly not, not a, a negative comment, is because this is actually a very inclusive approach. So we start by defining the uh, goals of ecosystem-based management, goals and targets, and that in itself is an inclusive process. It has to include uh, resource users, uh, society, NGOs, etc. So that process takes time. Developing indicators and ecosystem assessment then the quite a, uh, this is an important area that's often uh, kind of gl glossed over, if you like, is analyzing uncertainty and risk associated with both the interpretation of the indicators and then next steps. So here we have, oops, evaluating strategies, and then this takes you into an inner loop of implementing management actions, evaluating and assessing outcomes, and monitoring of ecosystem indicators. And as you can see, there's offshoots here. So it's basically a way of conceptualizing the system and conceptualizing how to approach that system in order to assess it and then respond. 
And the various steps in this is the, the use of indicators, but also models and other quantitative assessments. And uh, there may be some people in the room who have more or more um, hands-on experience with IEAs, and if, if, if so, we can perhaps discuss that a bit further in the week. But this is just to, to show you that this exists and is what's being used largely in the US at this stage. In Europe, they're so doing the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive which, you know, the DIPSA framework, the IEA, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, they're all essentially using indicators to, to assess the state of the system and then to figure out what to do with it. So they're just different, essentially, implications of a similar approach. Um, within the EU, um, the, the EU... It's called the MSFD, Management Strategy Framework Directive. It's a way to implement an ecosystem approach uh, to the management of human activities in the, in the oceans. Um, if you want to read, there's masses of documentation on the EU websites. Um, lots of it is in very legalese, gobbledygook, but some of it is, there's quite a few nice papers out now that describe how things have been progressing and developing indicators, etc. Uh, but the idea is that the framework uh, lays down criteria and standards to allow consistency and approaching the value, sorry, the extent to which the marine systems of the EU have reached good environmental status. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the objective is to have ecologically diverse and dynamic oceans which are clean, healthy and productive by 2020. And that's defined by this good environmental status. So there are 11 qualitative descriptors to measure good environmental status. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these now, but they range from diver sorry, diversity through marine feed webs, eutrophication, um, and then there's another six I'll show you in a moment. And for each of these 11 uh, descriptors, there are task groups that have been developed both within the ICES world and also in the JRC, the Joint Research Centre. And Many scientists all over Europe have spent the last number of years uh, figuring out what indicators to use, how they behave, what makes sense, what doesn't. Uh, so it's, it's been a massive um, effort, if you like, on behalf of all the EU nations. And there is some progress to date. By 2012, they had to um, provide information on their initial assessments, essentially. And there are a couple of reports out which are dated this year, so these are very recent. Um, so one's an in-depth assessment of the EU member state submissions for the MSFD, and then the other's a report from the Commission to the Council and European Parliament on the, imp the so basically the results of the first phase of the imp implementation of the MSFD. And their overall conclusion is that European seas are not in a good environmental status based on these 11 descriptors. 39% um, of the stocks in the Northeast Atlantic and 88% in the Mediterranean and Black Sea are still overfished, and the improvements are only, are only slow. Pollution uh, has decreased in some places, but levels of nutrients and other hazardous substances are overall still above acceptable limits. Oxygen depletion as a result of nutrient pollution is particularly serious in Baltic and Black Seas. A marine, marine litter, mostly plastic, and this is a, this is a huge global issue. I, th I think we're probably all aware of that, but they've quantified it here, and uh, over 90% of fumers have plastic in their stomach. So it's a growing issue and one that they're uh, still grappling with. And then lastly, although they're not looking at climate change directly, um, it's also recognised that this is going to further contribute to the degradation of marine ecosystems. So... I, I was quite impressed by the fact that within the EU, this is sort of, you know, within EU fisheries policies, there's so much, you know, bargaining and discussion goes on. You think it's very bureaucratic and it seems very slow. But the fact that in the EU they've actually managed to implement the MSFD and have already reported within a relatively short time frame, yeah, it's kind of impressive. I'm not sure what's going to happen as a result of that. I'm not part of that system, but. Um, the fact that we can now quantify uh, the state of the oceans and have some idea of what, what the main problems are, I think, is excellent. Can I, can I comment? Yes, please. Yeah. You know, the, one, one possible contributor, the reason you see these good resources, uh, 
for the last five years, they have an EU fisheries commission called Maria Damanaki. And she has been amazing. I mean, one person changing almost the whole system through working with both parties, actually, collaboratively. She managed to deal with all these negotiations and come up with this plan of progressive things. Interesting. So it's down to one person. So yeah, it's remarkable, at least as a starting point. So you can change things. That's my message, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Just start to build it. So, so we'll, we'll discuss this a bit later on. But, but just to elaborate on that, mm -hmm. I totally agree. She had a huge impact on what happened. But the reason that she could do that is that for the several decades before, for at least a couple of decades before, a lot of different scientists and even a lot of different people from the industry were, and NGOs, were pointing out the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically it took a much longer genesis to get to the point where that was enabled. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. Oh, thank you for that uh, addition. All right, the, the last, I think it's the last thing I'm going to talk about, more or less, um, is it's just to emphasize the need then, and this is probably apparent from what we've just been looking at, but the need for suites of indicators. Um, uh, of course, ecosystems are, uh, systems are complex systems, and, and that complexity can't be captured with an indicator. I think that, that's pretty obvious to all of us. Um, so we, we want to develop a, a, a suite of indicators, but at the same time, uh, the, the, there is a danger of drowning in too many indicators. Um, so there, there are several um, negatives of having too many indicators. One, of course, is that you have to collect the data to, to, to estimate all those indicators. But often, uh, several indicators will essentially measure the same thing. And so it's important to um, uh, explore a, a, a larger suite of indicators and reduce it to those that are the most informative. And again, we'll talk about that a bit more over the next few days. So you want a parsimonious suite of indicators that avoids redundancies, that basically uh, captures the ecosystem attributes or properties you want or biophysical properties you want. And uh, by having a, a suite of indicators that, that uh, speak to each of the different aspects that you want to capture, then avoids bias by having you know, 20 indicators that measure more one part area and only a few that measure some other part of the system. Um, all right, we already know that. Um, so just briefly, the, one of the projects I've been involved in is indicators, uh, indices, indicators for the seas, where we've developed a parsimonious uh, suite of indicators, and these are the different uh, ecosystems in yellow that we have uh, representatives for. Um, and this parsimonious suite of ecological indicators is essentially eight different indicators, uh, ranging, and this is, these are ecological indicators, so fish size, lifespan, biomass, percentage of predators, etc. We don't have to go into too much detail there, but the idea that each of these indicators uh, speaks to a conservation goal, which is on the right-hand side. So, for example, ecosystem functioning or system resilience, uh, resource potential, conservation of biodiversity. So th these were the sort of four attributes of the systems that were considered to essentially capture what was um, th their overall status. And by uh, defining indicators that measure those goals, then we can be... Um, well, ho hopefully capture how those systems will change over time. Um, and so we, we uh, estimated those indicators of a range of systems um, using a, a, a lot of different methods. So we looked at trend analysis, we used decision trees, we did a ranking methods. And for several of those systems, we got similar results. So um, I think five of those systems, the results were similar that they were, they were negative. So overall, the, the trends were negative, indicating negative impacts of fishing. Um, and in other four systems, they actually got fairly positive results. Oops. And then in, in the final systems, we had mixed results in different methods, which is also telling us something, that there's something else going on in addition to fishing. And it transpired that when we looked at different drivers, um, in the systems with more mixed results, there was also larger environmental effects going on. And so it wasn't just a clear fishing effect, there was a necessity to differentiate fishing from climate. 
And that's something, um, I think Scott, you mentioned that earlier, and that's something we'll come back to during this week too, is that indicators can respond to multiple drivers. And it's important to try and distinguish. If you're managing for fishing, for example, and it's actually an environmental effect that's causing the negative change and not fishing, then you may still have to, to reduce the fishing effort because if the environment is changing anyway, then you have to deal with the status of the stop. But it's important to understand what's causing the change in your indicators. All right, the, the final, I'm just going to touch very briefly on the, the notion of reference points, and we're going to come back to that uh, during this week. Um, so we need a reference points to figure out where we are in relation to where we want to be, essentially. Um, and just very simply, then, that there are guideposts and this idea, and we talked about this already, really, um, and just hammering the point home, is, you know, if this is where we are and this is our reference point, then this is the gap between where we are and where we want to be or where we don't want to be if it's a, a, a lower limit point. And uh, they're essentially guideposts, and they allow us to, um, or they guide us in terms of what the necessary next steps might be. All right, that was all I was going to say. Just to recap, this is the ground I've covered. Um, hopefully I've not bored you to tears and you've got uh, a, a better idea of the, sort of the, the broad world of indicators. It is a broad world. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions if we've got time. We might have a few minutes. And that's Shanghai at night time. <laughs> Just to give you a taste for what else is in store this week. Thank you. <laughs>